another aspect of what we want to talk about is the self image and self confidence of every individual uh is is always measured by sorry not always but very often is measured by what do i have that i could offer somebody else in other words my profession my knowledge my expertise what value is it to someone else um in a monetary form it means is somebody else willing to pay for my services is someone else willing to pay for my knowledge my expertise my consultation or is someone else willing to pay for my labor because i'm an expert or i'm really good at what i do uh, or somebody willing to hire me in their company for you know the expertise that i have in Judaism, there's actually a very different approach to this as to what self-worth a person has and what the potential impact they can have on other people and those around them. And that's going to be a that's going to be one of the core um, takeaways from tonight's lesson. So let's go right into it. I'm not going to read every single verse here, but this is from this week's parsha, and we talk about the menorah and how the menorah was shaped. Now, I want to skip, I'm going to leave this on the screen so you guys could read it, but it describes, this is from the verses, where it describes how the menorah was shaped, and that there were three cups, upside down cups, um, on, on each branch that would, um, you know, add to the design, and so on. It goes through the details here in the verses. I'm not reading it, you're welcome to read it on the, on the screen. But what I want to do is I want to skip to, and we'll come back to this text, the image of the Rambam. What you see on the screen over here was actually uh, on the right was actually drawn hand drawn by Maimonides over a thousand years ago, um, where he was trying to describe the the way and the shape of the menorah based on Kabbalah, based on the way it was it was not the book of Kabbalah, but the way it was passed down from generation to generation from Moshe Rabbeinu, and how it was known to be in the uh, in the Beis Hamikdash. So here's where the Rambam points out that the branches were. Were, were straight and not rounded. But what we're going to talk about tonight is take a look at the cups, not the cups at the top of each branch, but the cups that were the decoration uh, of each of each branch. It almost looks like those water cups, those triangle water cups that you have at a water fountain. So, you know, you don't put the cup down and leave it somewhere uh, where it has like a where it has like a point at the bottom and it opens up at the top. Now. This is actually a real type of cup. We're going to see in a second how it describes what kind of cup this is. But it's interesting that the cups are upside down, biblically meant to be upside down. Let's go back to the text that we just skipped. All right. So, sorry, two more screens. Take a look at verse number 33. I have a question about the cups. Because yeah, the, sure. cups up, the cups upside down makes it look like it's a stand. What do you mean like a stand? Like it's the, it's like a base. Like it's 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 like a base that, that they're standing on. In the picture that you drew, like the cups that are on the bottom. I didn't draw that picture, but yeah. But you're saying it makes it look like it's supposed to be that way or not supposed to be that way? Well, it it doesn't, you know, I, I wouldn't, it, it doesn't always look like a cup to me. It looks like maybe a base. Right, right. And w which, which, exactly right. It's a base. It looks like a base and not a cup. Like an, but here's, we're, we're going to break that down because okay. it's very, very puzzling how the Torah tells us to do this. So look at verse number 33. Three, de three decorated goblets on one branch. A knob and a flower and three decorated goblets on one branch, a knob, a flower, and so for the six branches comes out of the menorah. So the 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 um the, the verse itself does not say uh that the, the cups need to be upside down. In fact, it doesn't even describe what kind of goblets we're talking about. As we know from the Torah, that the verse in the Torah is a code, and the sages help elucidate that code. So now Let's break down, specifically verse number 33, let's break down what type of goblets we're talking about and how they should be positioned. So let's go straight to the Talmud. So the Talmud asks this question on, ver on verse 33. What did the goblets of the menorah look like? So the Gemara answers, they were like Alexandrian, I can't pronounce this word. I tried to research it uh, in terms of what it, I know what it is, but I can't pronounce this word. Um, 
those who are more um, educated historically, you're welcome to uh, chime in here. But it basically means the chalices, chalices, chalices. chalices. A, 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 a chalice goblet is basically what the menorah had, but the other way around, the Sioux, the way you were saying. Uh, what What is this opposed to? In other words, what other options were there? So Maimonides points out that the goblets were Alexandrian chalices, but what made, in other words, what defined the characteristic of these goblets? Why those chalices? Why does the Talmud say those chalices? Because specifically they had wide mouths. In other words, the top was was wide and the narrow and the base was narrow. That's what was the def that was the characteristic or the definition of these these chalices or these goblets. I'm learning so much about you know uh, uh, decor and um, and and tableware. Um, but the but. The point is, is halachically, this was this is a serious thing. That the menorah had to be had to be fashioned that way, with specifically those kind of goblets. So, how do we know they were supposed to be upside down? So, let's continue. So, the Talmud says like this: One fulfills their obligation only when uh, only when mitzvot are used in the manner of their growth, as the verse states, "Acacia wood standing." So, this is a, a halachic principle that applies in most cases. So, for example, when the Mishkan was, was built, the Mishkan is the tabernacle, which was the mini temple they had in the desert. So they were supposed to, supposed to build it out of acacia wood. Now, the way the even once it was cut and it was prepared for the construction, it had to be fashioned in the way, in the way it grows. In other words, you have to stand it up as if it was, you know, top to bottom, top to bottom of the tree. I'm not sure how that was done practically. I guess they knew from, you know, even after they, you know, they prepared it as wood and not just as a tree, I guess they knew what was the top and what was the bottom. And the top had to be the top and the bottom had to be the bottom. And that's how they fulfilled the obligation of using the acacia wood for the, um, for the, for the tabernacle, for the Mishkan. On, on a side note, we have a young man in friendship circle who's 14 years old. He's actually 15 now. Uh, he's an expert craftsman. He knows every type of wood and he built a uh, ark out of acacia wood um, as a way to commemorate this this mitzvah of building the mishkan of building the he knows apparently what acacia wood he knows how to find acacia wood he uh, fashioned it beautifully um to commemorate what you know this mitzvah of using acacia wood to build the to build the temple to build the tabernacle um but once again the Torah is being the, the Torah is being very care, very specific here. The Talmud is being very specific here that the mitzvah of use, using something physically it has to be used in the way it's way it grows. And let's 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 examine that here. The Mishkan follows the principle of using the mitzvot in the manner of their growth. So how could it be that the goblets were affixed to the menorah in a manner that was opposite of their growth, i.e., their natural state? So where do we even know? That the goblets were, were supposed to be upside down. So let's go back to Maimonides for a second. And over here, give me a second, over here. So Maimonides is the one that explains the the goblets, being the goblets being um, you know, the, the Alexandria. Well, even though the Talmud says it, but the but the Talmud, but but Maimonides explains the idea of being wide on the top and and narrow on the bottom. And yet in his own drawing. He shows them upside down. So, and there's other sources, by the way. We don't have, I don't know if we have the text there, but there's other sources that that tell you that the goblets were upside down. So once again, um, why, and this this sketch is, is, is considered to be the most legitimate um, de uh, depiction of what the menorah looked like. So what, what is Maimonides trying to teach us? And what is Maimonides is just elucidating to us what the Torah is teaching us. So what is the Torah trying to teach us by saying, A, we have to use these goblets, these Alexandrian, Alexandrian chalices. Thank you, whoever um, chimed in there. Um, but specifically with the wide top and the and the and the narrow bottom. And what got into the Rambam to say that they should be upside down. So let us go further. And we're going to use a uh, an example from the windows of the um, of the temple of the Beis Hamikdash. 
So the windows of the temp of the holy temple had a had a very distinct difference than the windows of any other home, uh, and it's referred to in in the book of in 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 the story of King Solomon building the base of Mikdash. But specifically, the Mishnah tells us very clearly, sorry, not the Mishnah, the Medrash tells us very clearly um, how the windows were were different in the base of Mikdash from any other windows. So in the olden and once again, I'm going to paraphrase here. You're welcome to read it on the screen from the original text, but. In the olden days, the way they would um, make windows to homes is they would have a very narrow opening uh, on the outside of the wall. So the walls were made of stone usually. Um, and they would make a narrow opening on the outside to, to catch the light. And that opening would widen as, you know, as it came through the cement, it would widen to bring that light into the house, but in a more wider fashion. So basically think of a funnel. The bottom of a funnel is facing the outside. and that, and that Opening of the funnel is facing the inside, so it would sort of bring light in without letting any animals or any um, intruders in into the house. That's how most windows were fashioned. Um, but the base Hamikdash, on the other hand, the temple was just the opposite. The temple had the narrow opening on the inside and the wide opening on the outside. And the question is why? So the, the answer given is to teach us that the Beis HaMikdash, the Holy Temple's role, or the purpose of the Holy Temple, was to spread light outwards. Usually at a home, what are you trying to do with windows? You're trying to, when the sun comes up, you should be able to bring in natural light into the home. Uh, usually, you know, many people, when they go into their home, and it's on, during the daytime, they want to bring in sunlight, so they open the curtains, they want windows, uh, sun to come in. So in, in, in a normal home, you want sunlight to come into your home. But the base on Migdash, the purpose of the base on Migdash was just the opposite. It was to spread light to the outside and to the rest of the world. Uh, of course, it's spiritual light, but to spread that light was its purpose, and the windows demonstrated that. Now, a very practical question is asked. Um, we'll get to it in a second. But a very practical question, we'll get to this in a second, I mean. A very practical question is asked. Um, why? Like, first of all, the windows of the base of Migdash, it was you couldn't go there. You couldn't go to the outside of it. So it wasn't like it was practically giving light. And also, when the Israelites were in the in the desert, um, when the whole mitzvah of the tabernacle was given to them, they didn't need windows because they had the light of Hashem. So why was the base of Migdash? Why like what was unique about the base of Migdash that all of a sudden they needed to have windows and the windows had to be facing outwards? So. The, okay, so now let's read this. Like the goblets of the menorah, the base on Migdash's windows were fashioned unconventionally. The reason for this was because the windows in the base on Migdash were there to spread the light of the menorah, a representation of God's presence. Like I said, it's a spiritual light. And here comes the question. The Talmud asks very simply, does God require its light? Did the children of Israel travel for 40 years in the desert exclusively? Didn't. I'm sorry, didn't. The children of Israel traveled for 40 years in the desert exclusively by his light. In other words, they had spiritual light, spiritual protection with the clouds. So rather, the idea of the windows was a testimony that divine presence rests among Israel, specifically in the Holy Temple, and the windows showed the purpose of it is not to keep it, not to hoard it for ourselves, but to spread it and to share it with the rest of the world and be a light unto the nations, as we know. So now, the purpose of the menorah was to spread light outwards. The Beis HaMikdash's windows confirm this by showing that we're not here to take light in, we're here to spread light out. And the cups on the menorah were contributing to this theme of sharing light to the, out, to, to the outside. What is a cup? What, that, what is the idea of a goblet? Is a goblet, you're usually pouring something into it to enjoy for yourself. That's what a goblet is. You have a personal cup on your table and your, your uh, setting. You know, I've been to some houses where they have a separate cup for, for drinking and a separate wine glass. Because, you know, you need to have, you can't mix wine and other drinks. You have to, like, uh, enjoy it separately. The point is, that the idea of a glass, the idea of a goblet or a cup, whatever you want to call it, is all about collecting something for yourself. Nothing wrong with it. We all need water. We all need drinks. We all need sustenance. But that's what a cup is. So comes the menorah and turns these cups upside down to demonstrate that the purpose of the menorah is not to hoard the light for itself, not to hoard the, 
the the revelation of God and the blessings and everything else that we, we that we want for ourselves, but immediately to turn it over and share it with others. That's the first message. Sorry, that's the that's the ultimate es essential message of the menorah to to spread light uh, to the world, and therefore the upside down cups rep represent that. That God forbid to think that we're here just collecting it for ourselves, but we're here to share this light with the rest of the world. But that doesn't answer another question. This is actually cool. When a cup is in its natural state of serving others, it is positioned upside down. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, but this is a, there's another problem here. And that problem is, why the narrow bottom? Why does the Talmud tell us that it has to be an Alexandrian ch uh, chalice? I'm saying that right. Um, which the Rambam explains to mean as the narrow bottom and a wide top. You could, un we understand why the cup had to be upside down, as the Rebbe is going to explain right here in, in beautiful words. When the cup's purpose, this is text eight on the screen. When the cup's purpose is for holding liquid, then its natural state is for the base to be on the bottom and the opening to be upright on the top. But the cups and the menorah symbolize the idea of irrigation and illuminating the world. So their natural state was the opposite way with the opening on the bottom and the base on the top. We turn the glass upside down so that we could pour from it to show that it's about giving, it's about sharing, it's about spreading the light versus hoarding the light. Beautiful. But why the narrow bottom? I'm sorry, we're not down here. I'm sorry. The menorah's light was intended to illuminate the world, which was on a spiritually lower level than the temple, because the temple was the place where God's essence rests. It was the source of godliness for the rest of the world. And therefore, the menorah's purpose was to spread that light to the rest of the world from the base of English, from the temple, and share it with the rest of the world. As such, the natural state of its cups was to be upside down, pouring out light. So now, very good. That's why the cups were upside down. We have that answer. But there's another problem here. And that is, why the narrow base? What is so important for it to why couldn't it be regular goblets with a with a normal base and like sue like you were saying like like it should be it should be more of a natural state for for there to be a base on the bottom of a cup because a cup has to rest on a base so what's the what's the uniqueness of the narrow bottom so we'll get back to this verse in a second but there's a in fact i want to speak to this verbally and then we'll see it in the text there's a misconception about what level of a, a what type of person you have to be or what type of of individual you have to be to be worthy quote unquote of sharing knowledge with somebody else so i'm going to give you an example and i'm i'm not trying to say right or wrong i'm just trying to get our heads or wrap wrap our heads around the the idea of society's approach. When somebody gives uh, um, a, a health tip, or let's say they give medical advice, the first thing we want to know is what's their background? Are they a doctor? Do they have a degree? And rightfully so, you know, taking health tips or medical advice from someone who's not experienced is probably not a good idea. But generally speaking, we want to know your qualifications before we take advice from you. If you're going to give us a scientific um, um, a, a scientific knowledge about the universe or about the world or about the human body or about anything, we want to know what your qualifications are. Uh, if you're going to give us a history lesson, we'll probably want to know what your knowledge or expertise is. So we should know if we could trust you or not, or do we need a val or do we need to verify through, you know, through Wikipedia? Uh, the point is, is that we always want to know. Not always, but more often than not, we want to know the source of, of knowledge, where it's coming from, and what qualifications the person has. But it goes deeper than that, because sometimes people could speak with an authority and convince others that they're experts in something, as we see from swindlers or from, or from um, uh, con artists or from, or from um, Ponzi schemes. That there have been people that have convinced others that they are experts or that whatever, and they can and unfortunately stole and 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 hurt many people that way. So even though they didn't have the expertise or their knowledge or they didn't have the data to back up what they were saying, they had the communication ability to convince other people to trust them. So there automatically becomes an insecurity, right for right or wrong, I don't know, but there there becomes an insecurity to share information. 
and to share knowledge because if I don't have a degree or if I don't have the expertise or if I don't have, you know, if I'm not, I don't want to be the person who just spews information, right? And, and we might be right by thinking so, you know, it says very clearly that the Siagel Chachmal Shtika in, in Perkei Avot, it says that the the advice to the wise is to is to remain silent, is to speak less or, or speak less, do more, but not just that, but just, you know, remain silent is, is, is a good thing. However, when it comes to sharing Judaism, when it comes to sharing knowledge of Judaism, when it comes to share spirituality, when it comes to um, helping a friend, the Torah does not want us to wait until we have it all figured out. The Torah does not want us to, to question ourselves. Am I good enough or do I have enough background or do, or do I have enough um, um, uh, validation to be telling someone else or helping someone else or advising someone else about their Jewish life, Jewish observance, or Jewish spiritual connection. Now let's read some of the text. It is known, and, and the verse that we skipped before was the famous verse that Ner Havai and Ishmael Adam, that the, the candle of, of, of God, the light of God, the candle of God is the soul that we all have inside of us. Um, and here's a very well-known uh, uh, quote from Musser. It is known that the soul derives pleasure from lighting candles. It becomes excited from the enjoyment of light, for it itself is a piece of light. Therefore, it is drawn after its kind light. Even though one is a physical flame and the soul is pure spiritual and abstract light, nevertheless, both are a type of light. And this is why Shlomo Amalek compares the soul to a light, Nerevai and that a person's soul is Hashem's lamp. So that being said, that the soul is naturally like a candle, always trying to... The reason why we compare it to a candle and not just any form of light is because you see with a flame, a flame is always trying to jump upwards. A flame is always trying... A flame is never comfortable. It's never settling. It's always moving. It's always jumping. And the soul is always trying to latch on to spirituality. It's always trying to latch on to, to, to godliness, to accomplish something. It's never, it's never complacent or comfortable with itself. It really wants to fulfill its mission in the world. It's another comparison that's brought up about flame. Now, what gives the soul most pleasure? Just like a human being, the physical human being, the physical um, uh, animalistic self that we have derives pleasure for taking something for itself, making money, um, um, feeding ourselves, whatever other pleasures we enjoy, the human body appreciates that. The soul is just the opposite. The soul derives pleasure, the neshama derives pleasure when it's shearing from itself to others. Just the opposite. That's why there, there's the clash between the animalist, our animalistic soul, our intrinsic natural physical body, versus our godly soul, because our godly soul is deriving pleasure from sharing the light and connecting light with other uh, spiritual, spiritual connections, specifically other people, while the animalistic soul wants to bring in for itself to uh, to satisfy to satisfy and satiate its own needs and its own desires. So that being said, the Rebbe goes on. It can be that with sorry, it can, it can be that with regard to our own personal spiritual journey, our base is narrow. This is now to explain why the Rambam and why the first the Talmud says the Alexandrian chalice, but why the Rambam characterizes that as wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, and then puts it upside down. Sometimes we might feel that our spiritual status, our observance level, our whatever it is we think about ourselves spiritually, we might feel that we're narrow and limited, that we haven't, we have yet a lot to learn, or we don't do everything so right, or we're not doing, we're not living the, the way a Jew should live exactly perfect or whatever, whatever we think about ourselves. This could be at the beginning of our journey or even later, uh, later on for, some, for whatever reason. But when it comes to influencing another person, and especially when it comes to influencing the world at large to make it into a home for God, we must know that we must engage in the service without any limitations. Our state must be that of a wide open upside down goblet. This is a, a this is a very important statement to unpack. Well, let's unpack it together. It's not just don't. It's not actually. Golda, the prime minister, the former prime minister of Israel, Golda Meir, had a had a very famous line, one of my favorites. That's that said, don't be so humble, you're not that great. Um, it's not just about, but it's not just about like being humble of, oh, like who am I to speak? Who am I to give a, a Dvar Torah? Or who am I to, 
to give spiritual or Jewish advice to someone? Who am I to, um, you know, respond to somebody on social media who's, you know, thirsty for Jewish knowledge? Who am I to advise my friend who who, who wants, you know, help, help in Jewish knowledge? Because I don't know as much as I should, or I haven't done as much as I should. The problem with, with that thinking is that is nothing to, life has nothing to do, our goal, our mission in life has nothing to do with, where we stand at any specific moment versus what has to get accomplished. And one of my favorite examples of this in, in Judaism is actually in a, in a law about charity, where if somebody loses money and a poor person finds it and is able to buy dinner with it, the one who lost the money actually gets credit for the charity. Even though they lost the money, they didn't give the charity. But in heaven, their soul and their their existence is credited with the charity. Why? Because ultimately it's about the results. It's about what gets done. And the fact is, money that this person earned went to buy this person a meal. Ah, you didn't give him the money, or you didn't, you know, do it the way you were supposed to. Your intentions weren't weren't fine. Next time you'll get it right. But the point is, the fact is, is that your money fed this person. It's about results. So when there's someone else who needs your help spiritually, you cannot start thinking, well, what do I have to offer? The fact is right now somebody needs your help. Someone needs your spiritual guidance. Someone needs your, your influence. And the little that you do have, you need to use that to with a wide open, with a wide open cup, with a wide open upside down cup to share with the other people. Even if you feel that the base, your base, is so narrow that there's so little at the bottom of it, you still are committed to fulfilling and doing what your mission in life and what your purpose in life is to help other people and to spread light. And that's the message of the menorah. Don't wait for the base to be full at the bottom and, and you know, complete and overflowing, and then I'll go teach. In fact, we always have, and that's what the name of this lesson is called, that we always have this saying that if you know the letter Aleph, even if you don't know the letter Bays, the two first letters of the, of the, of the Hebrew alphabet, even if you know the letter Aleph, teach Aleph. And then when you learn Bays, you'll teach Bays. But right now, you, because you know something, you know Aleph, go ahead and teach it. Never underestimate yourself. Never sell yourself short in your spiritual capabilities of spreading light and influence, influencing others. The Rebbe goes on. Just as we work on improving ourselves, so must we engage with others as well. We must not rationalize that I have plenty to do to work on myself, knowing myself and my flaws. So what right do I have to influence others? Rather, as the fifth Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe Roshab said, we have no idea what still needs to be accomplished in the task of preparing the world for the era of Mashiach, for the era of ultimate peace. So we must not make any rationalizations about what needs to get done. An opportunity we encounter, we must immediately seize that opportunity and fulfill the mitzvah of sharing the knowledge and sharing the light whenever that opportunity arises. And here is a beautiful example that summarizes it all. Not that. But the story goes like this. A college student, who was obviously, you know, observant, but probably limited in his observance, once approached the Rebbe in the middle of a Hasidic gathering to greet him with a Lachayim. And the Rebbe turned and asked him if he was involved in encouraging and helping his fellow students put on tefillin every day. And the college student admitted to the uh, and said, you know, I don't put on tefillin every day. So who am I to try to convince someone else to put on tefillin every day? So the Rebbe answers, why is that their fault? In other words, just because you don't put on tefillin every day, okay, fine, you'll work on that. But just because you don't do it doesn't mean you shouldn't help others do it. It's a mitzvah. So yes, you'll, you have to work on yourself to put on tefillin every day, and that's something you can work on whenever you have time. But doesn't take away from the fact that you have friends who you could help put on tefillin. This right here, I don't think we realize, but this right here, this right encapsulates the Rebbe's mission and the Rebbe's approach to people. And in the way that the Rebbe empowered thousands of Chabad Shluchim to go into all these crazy places in the world and spread light, whether they were qualified or not, the idea was is that you'll, you'll figure out how to get qualified. The fact is, is you have something to share. Go ahead and find people who you can share it with. We, we can't afford to keep this information for ourselves. We can't afford to keep light for ourselves. In this world of darkness, we have to spread light. We have to use every opportunity to share light with others and to share knowledge with others, even if we ourselves still have work to do. In other words, why is it 
the rest of the world's fault if we didn't do our job. Let's still get out there and make a difference in spreading the light. Um, in, in today's um, in today's Jewish world, we all see and know what's going on, not just from an Israeli perspective and what Israel's going through, but also from a Jewish perspective. So how much more so for us to not to not sell ourselves short in what we could accomplish by encouraging each other and helping each other and spreading light to each other uh, and using every opportunity that we have, whether we feel capable or not, or whether we feel um, whether we feel that we are okay or not. But if we have an opportunity to share and to encourage someone else and to and to inspire someone else, we don't have a right to hold that back. And that's the message of the menorah: is that upside down cups, narrow with narrow tops and wide bottoms. In this case, narrow tops because it's upside down. Is that regardless of what we think about ourselves and where we're holding, we always have a mission to share the light just as the menorah taught us. So let us hope, even though we don't have the base on Migdash, and even though we don't have, we don't have the um, the spiritual light of the Holy Temple, but by still having it in our hearts, as it says in this week's parasha, that I, Hashem says, I want to build a sanctuary within every single, within, w- within them. It doesn't say I want to build a sanctuary and I will dwell within it. It says, I'll build me a sanctuary, Vasuli Mikdash, and I will dwell within them, within each individual, that we all have a base on Mikdash, we all have a holy temple within us. In other words, we have a menorah within us that is dying to spread light. So let us not hold it back and let us do everything we can to share whatever light we have and whatever knowledge we have and whatever inspiration we have with whoever we whoever is willing to listen to spread the light. And may that ultimately bring us to the true light, which will come, which will be revealed with the coming of Mashiach. So that is our message, and that is the message from the menorah and the upside down menorah. Uh, never sell yourself short, um, and always remember to share the light. Always remember that it's not about you. It's not about how you feel about yourself. It's always about what what has to get done. What's the mission? What's the results that we're looking for? And let's do everything we can to achieve those results. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, may we have peace, and um, okay. only have good news, and with the especially with the coming of